It's September 21st, 1933, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. Throughout history, it has pretty much always been considered fun to watch enormous men grapple with one another and then pin each other to the ground, but the genre of entertainment only really began being perfected on this day in 1933, when a form of wrestling came into being that would eventually feature masks and spandex suits and high boots and ropes and pseudonyms at the debut match of La Empresa Mexicana de Lucha Libre, Mexico's first ever national pro wrestling promotion. Yeah, and it was kicked off by a pretty unlikely founder, a guy called Salvador Lutarov Gonzalez, who is a pretty straight-laced looking, bespectacled tax collector living in Ciudad Juarez. And he frequently traveled to El Paso over the border in Texas, where wrestling was a popular attraction, the traditional American carny sideshow style of wrestling. And this is where he got the idea of forming a nationwide wrestling promotion in Mexico for Mexico, the Empresa Mexicana de Lucha Libre, which he founded on this day with his partner, Francisco Ahumada. Yeah, these were worth underlining that sort of wrestling pre-existed this. I mean, that's obvious, but what Gonzalez did on this day, essentially, is is come up with the idea of putting it in a building. It's a bit like when they founded Miss America, and we were talking about that. It's not a sophisticated idea. You know, let's have a beauty pageant. (laughs) It was being done. But making it national, making it slick... That's what they did with Mexican wrestling on this day. Yeah, wrestling in Mexico goes back to the 19th century. A chap called Enrique Ugatechea created the first gym where wrestlers were trained. And it's from him, apparently, that we get the word lucha libre, meaning basically free wrestling, freestyle wrestling. It's kind of like Greco-Roman wrestling, but you can also do drop kicks. Yeah. yeah, wrestling has been going on in Mexico even longer, but it was that Greco-Roman style of wrestling that had originated in Europe, and then it made its way over to the New World with European occupiers. So according to Ring Heritage, an early history of Mexican lucha libre by Mike Least, the first recorded wrestling tournament in Mexico was a Greco-Roman style bout in 1863 between French soldiers and Marines. But it seems like the first Mexican wrestler came a little bit later. He was called Antonio Perez de Prian, and he learned this art from a French soldier and then travelled the country showing off his skills at carnivals and circuses but again it was this Greco-Roman style of wrestling so Ugata Chea is credited as the first luchador of the lucha libre tradition. You can sort of imagine can't you against the backdrop of the Mexican revolution that there would be some appetite for watching crazy no holds barred bare knuckled no rules stomp all over each other type wrestling you can see why that would be more appealing than something (laughs) that's very formal and it had its roots as a sideshow attraction in which members of the audience would be invited up to take on the wrestler so obviously it was going to be a pretty crude brawling style of wrestling because it's not like those people in the audience were going to pop up with their classical greco-roman moves it's just so funny though that it turned into this highly stylized and what is often said to be fake style of wrestling you know that it's no longer actually a physical contest, which is not to say that it doesn't involve a great deal of (laughs) physicality and athleticism, but it actually isn't wholly about which person is going to subdue the other based on their own physical prowess. Said to be fake, why are you choosing your words carefully? (laughs) Can't we just say we're a podcast for grown-ups? I mean, it's not scripted in the same way as WWE, as I understand it, so maybe even the contenders don't know who's going to win but they're not actually fighting in a way where they're deliberately hurting themselves, right? In that sense, it's fake. It's a series of basically ballet moves, isn't it? Although they obviously could hurt you very badly. Oh, no, I think it still is scripted in the same way as WWE. I think they still do have plot lines that are predetermined and winners who have been decided. But I'm sure from watching it that each move hasn't been choreographed. I mean, you can see them almost, it's all. It's almost like improv comedy. You can see them like, True. okay, what are we going to do now? Let's do the one where I jump from the bar over the top and then you somersault under me. Yeah, let's do it. You can see <laughs> yeah, them I mean, sort of working it out as they go along. I think that would make sense because when you watch Mexican wrestling, you can see that it's much more agile and fast paced and acrobatic than the American style that you might be used to, to the extent that wrestlers often start when they're still in their teens, which wouldn't be possible in a more strength based brawling kind of contest. So I think it would be very difficult for every move to be choreographed because just rehearsing that many moves in that amount of time would just surely take forever. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Regardless, it's Lutaroth who is seen as the kind of godfather of the whole promotion because he at least realised that to move it beyond this kind of regional, unconnected novelty show thing, he needed to A, have more homegrown stars and B, make something that was much more professional and nationwide. And so he actually saved for years to build this dream of his. And in 1933, along with this financial partner who Rebecca mentioned earlier, Ahumada, he founded this 
uh, new league. But he got lucky in so many ways, not least in a very literal way, by winning the literal lottery literally twice. Is the Mexican lottery above board as an institution? <laughs> we can say this is luck. <laughs> yeah. I'm just well, curious. If you're a wrestling magnate and you win the lottery <laughs> twice in yeah. Mexico, that, it smells fishy to me. I mean, I don't know. It does a little bit. Yeah. In 1934, he won the Mexican lottery, winning 40,000 mm. pesos. And and the second time was in the 1950s, and that was what allowed him to build this so-called Cathedral of Lucha Libre, the Arena Mexico, in 1956. And one completely legitimate above-board stroke of luck he had was that this arena was being built just as television was becoming popular, and all forms of wrestling could never have attained the status that they have without the power of TV. And it turned its major star, El Santo, into a nationwide folk hero. Yeah, so this is the dude who never took his mask off, right? So let's talk about the masks. The masks happened a year after this day. So in 1934, when uh, an American wrestler, actually, Corbin Massey, was performing as El Cyclone McKay. And as far as I can tell, it was essentially like a mix between like a, a business venture with a shoemaker who owned a shop <laughs> behind the arena who thought, let's diversify into masks that the kids can come back and buy after the show, and the wrestler himself, who just wanted a gimmick. And so he turned up one day in a mask and sort of inadvertently created this enormous tradition where once you'd seen him fight in a mask, everyone wanted a mask, and then... (laughs) There became this whole, like, codified strata of behaviour around masks. And he must have been a really good wrestler, quite aside from the mask. He went on to fight as La Maravilla and Mascarada, the masked marvel. And because of his growing popularity, Luteroth really began to experiment with more and more masked wrestlers. And then he spun it out into this battle of good and evil that really gelled with people, that became the Rudos or bad guys or heels against the technicos or faces or good guys. So there was this whole mythology that then sprung up around it that was in some ways inspired by indigenous Mexican folklore. Yeah, in a very real way, the masks are the wrestlers. El Santo famously never took his off except for once. About a week before his death, he briefly revealed his face on a talk show. That is standard for all masked wrestlers. They will not appear in public without their mask, although if they did, I guess you wouldn't know about it. But (laughs) (laughs) now I'm I'm saying it out loud. I think, well, how would you know? Um, But if a wrestler is unmasked in the ring, that can be used as a retirement either of the wrestler or simply that incarnation of the wrestler. He might take on then a new persona, but they can also be lost as a result of losing a lucha de apuesta a bet match is a really core element of lucha libre in which luchadores wager their masks so if you lose your opponent might rip off your mask which is obviously considered a huge loss of face or indeed mask you could they can also because not all wrestlers are masked if you're an unmasked wrestler you can bet your hair on the outcome and if the hair guy loses the other guy gets to shave his head (laughs) i just think it looks incredibly sweaty (laughs) <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's a difficult enough thing anyway, isn't it? Preparing yourself to do a leg lock or a spinning reverse neck breaker or a rapid hold. Doing it in a colourful mask in Mexico. I know they're air-conditioned stadia now, but still. I just think that would be horrible. Do you know what I mean? Like, just a really... You know, like, it would be hard to focus, wouldn't it? Because you'd be having a hard time. Someone kicking you in the face, even a staged <laughs> kick in the face, whilst you're wearing a mask, whilst you're thinking, now I'm going to backflip off this rope. Yeah. It just, I mean, just looking at the footage, so I sort of dislocate my shoulder as a secondary <laughs> medium. But the idea of actually being that person with that thing over your face is just horrendous. Well, I think this is the reason why so many wrestlers and also fans push back on the idea that it's fake, because it does involve a great deal of, yes, sweating, but also you know, physical output, and there's and there's real danger associated with the stuff that they do. If you get it wrong, you're landing on your head. Right. Like, that's the thing, isn't it? You know, however choreographed is, you're landing on your head and you can break your neck. And even if the outcomes are predetermined, Lucha does have a social impact in Mexico that WWE, for instance, definitely doesn't have in the US. In that, is it the Rudos, the, the bad guys, they take on often the personas of c- drug cartel lords, crooked politicians, corrupt cops, and the technicos, the good guys, 
they often represent the honest common man, workers, farmers. So there is this social angle that I don't think is really found in other wrestling promotions around the world. To the extent that there's even a, a luchador who doesn't actually wrestle, Super Barrio, he exists only outside the ring, showing up to support labour unions and anti-crime initiatives. <laughs> One interesting component is the way that when fans see a really good performance, they honour wrestlers by throwing money into the ring. Apparently they're very selective. They don't do it all the time. But when they've seen a really, really good show, then they throw money at their favourite performer. Is this your way of linking to our Patreon? Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> what I was thinking. <laughs> I'm not sure I would do what the wrestlers do, which is that they gather up the money and then they put it in a jar and never spend it because it's meant to be this mark of honour. How would you know they hadn't spent it because you don't know who they are? It's very clever. Oh, that's true. <laughs> Tomorrow. She had cut the skin of a maid's throat when she was asleep, then sewn it up again without waking her. Ditch the ads and get a Sunday episode when you join Club Retrospectors. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts, part of the ACAST Creator Network.